everyone, this is PK Entertainment and we're back again and here now we have another video for you and this will be a full on spoiler review for Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. Now you can check out both my non-spoiler review of the movie within the channel and also my reviews of all other previous films within the Indiana Jones franchise and I'll leave some links within the description. Now this won't be a chronological breakdown but much more of a free flowing discussion about the elements that I felt stood out the most, for better and for worse. So your final warning now, spoilers for Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny in 3, 2, 1. So the first element I want to talk about is the characterization of Indiana Jones. And sadly, this movie was yet again another deconstruction of an iconic cinematic hero. After the 20 minute opening, we see him in 1969 giving lectures with students who are disinterested and falling asleep. He's at the end of his teaching career, coming to retirement. He's living alone, being woken up by the noisy teenagers playing loud music at 8 o'clock in the morning. This is due to the moon landings. Living on his own, we learn that he's getting divorced from Marion, separated from her yet again. And you think actually when looking at this whole entire franchise that these two just aren't really destined to be happy and together. We then learn that his son, Mutt, who was played by Sheila Burr from Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, actually died when enlisting in Vietnam. And that the only reason that he enlisted was to spy Indy. So when you look at all of this, it really does feel depressing, whether this is any character, but especially when it's Indiana Jones. As I mentioned, Indiana Jones is one of the most iconic cinematic heroes, who we've all known to be daring, somebody who has to improvise, think on his feet, is extremely physically active and lives for the research. He lives for the adventure. And he also has that charm and swagger and confidence. So to see him here as his more grumpy, complacent, far less mobile version, is just such a downer. Now, of course, Harrison Ford is 80 years old, so we can't expect him to have that same sprite and energy and physicality. But again, it begs the question of why make the movie in the first place. Now, many people have stated that Indiana Jones can be recasted. I don't believe so. This is one of those examples where the character is very much defined by the actor. If that was the case, that he could just be recasted, then we would have had multiple Indiana Jones movies many years ago post Last Crusade. Now, of course, we know the reason why they make this movie again, because of a lack of creativity and desperation for money. But if he's too old to play the role, then why should you bring him back? Especially when you have to spend huge amounts of money de-aging him. You ask the question, was it really worth it? Especially for a movie that nobody was really asking for. And this tactic is something we've seen far too many times with the likes of Superman, James Bond and Luke Skywalker, where we're instead in this much more tragic, melancholic story arc that's just not needed for the character and goes against everything that made him special in the first place. We see it far too often and it was sad to see it yet again for Indiana Jones. And to follow on from this, we then talk about the de-aging process, the much hyped about technique that we've seen multiple times through these mainstream blockbusters. And in terms of this movie, this involved the opening 20 minutes where we saw Indy in 1944 trying to retrieve the Lance of Loginus with his companion Basil Short. And as mentioned in my non-spoiler review, the aging process worked when Indy was much more in stationary positions and at times it did impress both in the opening 20 minutes and also later when we had a second flashback where we had an older version of Indy talking to Basil about the obsession of the doll and then we see him eventually taking it this is of course where we saw a younger Helena as well now where did the agent didn't work as well was when Indy was far more active and we see this in certain moments when he's been hung up by the Nazis we get that bike chase echoing the one from Last Crusade we see when Indy's fighting on the train, you can see there's a clear disconnect between his face and his body. And I think it's to do with the frame rate of the facial movements, like it was too fast to really fully sync up with the body movements. But things looked even worse when he had these wider pattern shots of a CGI version of Indiana Jones running on the train. And it's things like this where you could have easily got a stuntman to do these parts and it would have made the flaws within the process far less noticeable. And I just feel that when you have a movie that's already so reliant on digital and green screen effects, having something like this when it's flawed, it really does take the viewer away from it. So they're focusing far more on the flaws of an technique rather than the story that's happening. So whilst it wasn't horrific to look at, and I suppose again, you will notice this more when you're looking at a larger screen as opposed to a smaller one, it wasn't the biggest issue within the film, but I just think Again, it warrants the question of why we were doing this in the first place. And I've always stated that CGI should be used as a supplementary to real life environments, blending in so you don't really use it. We use Lord of the Rings as the ultimate examples of this. 
But I was just thinking this movie, it was used too often. I said that more because we already had a movie that was reliant on CGI. We then talk about Phoebe Waller-Bridge as Helena and I realised that there's almost an unrelenting online hate campaign towards her. I don't really share the same feelings of hatred as what many do online and I'm simply going to say that based on this movie, she wasn't as bad as what other people made her out to be. Now did we get levels of the overcompetent Mary Sue that so many people talk about? Yes. We look at an example of that auto rickshaw chase where they're driving in the little carts and we see her leaping onto the car to try and retrieve the dial from Voller and then she's punching up the soldiers and leaning back and forward. We see later on where she drives on a bike during the pouring rain trying to board the plane. I'm sure there was a far more simpler way to have her do this. And overall as a character, she does have an overconfidence that can make her feel far less likeable. But honestly, she's a far lovelier presence than what Indiana Jones was. And she brings a lot more energy and personality than what the lead character does. Which goes back to the aged issue with Indiana Jones and also the characterization. And many people won't agree with what I'm saying. But I think in terms of this particular film, it would have been even more duller and more boring if Phoebe Waller wasn't there alongside Harrison Ford. Now there are some flaws in terms of the character of Helena, the fact that she has this ability to crack multiple codes yet all she wants is the Dole of Destiny but she's not even sure actually works. You would have thought somebody with this ability would have been able to crack enough codes to make herself multi-millions. So we ask the question, is this another example of a female character overtaking an iconic male character? I'm going to say no. Now, she does carry far more physical duties than what we'd expect, but yet again, this is to compensate for the fact that Indy is a lot older this time around. Now, in terms of the film, I did mention my non-spoiler review that was easily around 25 to 30 minutes too long. And the reason for this is because of the overextended sequences. For example, we have the riding of the horse where we see Indy trying to escape for his agents within the crowd. This sequence didn't do anything for me and the build up to this overall sequence really could have been shortened. I go back to the car chase sequence and we get a random moment where we see a Moroccan gangster coming out professing his undying love for Helena and that she betrayed him and this was just a really weird element to add to already a very long chase sequence to begin with. We then have the underwater sequence where they take a deep sea dive to find a tablet which gives directions to finding the second piece of the dial and this sequence really felt out of place for an Indiana Jones movie. And did we really need them to go out on yet another location to find further instructions to find a doll? And the movie does waste certain potential characters, whether it's Sulla who only appears for like two scenes to help out Indy. We have Antonio Banderas, Ronaldo, who gets brutally taken out, as does Agent Mason earlier on. But we don't get any time to really feel the impact of their deaths. Voller himself was a very weak and one note villain and I'm still confused as to how exactly he survived what was clearly a fatal blow to the head during the opening train sequence. I kept thinking throughout the film that we were going to get some sort of big reveal that maybe he was some sort of clone or some sort of other manifestation, maybe he had travelled back in time or forward in time. Because we had these moments where Mads Mikkelsen was making these little mannerisms in terms of his facial expressions and I kept thinking is this how he was somehow maintaining some sort of mask that he was wearing and that we would find that he was somebody else completely within the final act but that wasn't the case to be. We then have to go over what has been by far the biggest talking point throughout this film and that is indeed the final act and the ending. So it turns out then that Voller wants to go back in time with the dial to correct the mistakes that Hitler made back in 1939 to win the war for Germany. We then get a ridiculous moment when Helena asks Teddy, this is the smaller companion that was travelling along with them, to fly a plane in pursuit of Voller's plane and despite him having never flown a plane before, he somehow manages to competently do it, even when there's a pilot asleep on the plane as well. Why can't we just have Helena fly the plane or threaten the pilot to fly it in the first place in pursuit? But whatever at this point. It then turns out that all of Voller's calculations in terms of the dial were way off as he didn't account for the continental drift. Now for anybody who doesn't know, the continental drift is essentially where we see the continents moving over from a geological location over a certain amount of time. Now somehow Voller with all of his perceived intelligence didn't manage to consider this when devising his plan. And so what happens is that instead of arriving in Germany, they end up way back in 2002 BC, during the siege of Syracuse, 
where the Romans successfully stormed the island just as Indy was teaching the students early on throughout the film. How very convenient. And for some reason, the pilots within the plane decide to fly right amidst the battle amongst all of the catapults. I guess the complete distraught at the failure of their plan had left them in a dazed and confused state. And to be fair, I think the movie at this point did very well to convey all of those emotions of distraught during this sequence. We then see the plane eventually getting struck down and he just asks how would they have been able to do this considering how fast the plane would have been travelling within the air. But then Indy saves Helena who shoots Fuller before they parachute down from the plane what we've seen from the trailers which makes it crash land. We then see Archimedes, the creator of the doll, storming out as he sees the plane flying. He comes to the wreckage where he sees the dead body of Vola and he takes his watch. And they were clearly going for some time loop paradox as earlier on. We saw Indy and Helena come across the tomb of Archimedes where they were uncovering watches hidden. And then Indy and Helena come across Archimedes who turns out created the doll not to time travel but to hopefully create a portal to bring somebody or something back to help them win the battle. Now this makes absolutely no sense. How would Archimedes have predicted what would have come through the portal and when? It easily could have been somebody to help him, it easily could have been another enemy. He has absolutely no control over who comes through that portal and when. Now as I mentioned before, when seeing the tomb of Archimedes and him collecting the watches, this very much implies that Archimedes had already been using the doll to travel forward in time. How did he manage to do this? If we see that the portal was the only way to go through and that they had to use planes to travel, then how exactly did Archimedes manipulate his way to being able to travel through time? It couldn't have been through a big portal of the sky, could it? But apparently he has been time traveling back multiple times in order to try and figure out a way to help the Greeks win the war. Whatever at this point, and then we have the other very ridiculous moment where Indy having been shot earlier in what seemed by a very fatal wound, he was walking around for hours on the plane and was able to muster up enough strength in his aged years to be able to fight off multiple soldiers before saving Helena. But he comes to the moment where he decides that he wants to stay within this time period. Like why? Staying in the destroyed part of Sicily to live out your final moments, we assume, wouldn't have been any fitting way to pass away. He just wants to remain here and die. Again, this is far more deconstructive, changing of the character as what I've mentioned before. And then we get a truly stupid moment where Helena knocks him out and that's when they travel back in time to 1969. Now during this scene, she states that Indiana can't stay here because he will alter the change of history. But I'm sorry to say Helena, you've already done that by flying through to this time period in the first place and having all of the soldiers who were in the battle see the plane and actually meeting Archimedes, who in real history was actually slain in the original battle. So I hate to say you've already changed history, so Indy being there doesn't really make a lot of difference. And the whole way that this whole sequence of events was written was absolutely ridiculous. And I'm absolutely convinced that this section of the film was actually meant to happen earlier on. Maybe we would have introduced the time travel elements, maybe halfway through, and then we probably would have had two, three, or maybe four scenes of the heroes going back in time to different time periods and maybe ordering to try and stop Vola from doing what he was trying to do. And maybe the sequence of events got changed during the extensive reshoots. And if we think about it, Indy has already changed history by meeting and saving Archimedes. So does that change the current timeline? Does it create an alternate timeline? Does it have events later on down the line? Does it create a whole multiverse as what many movies are creating these days? It's just so confusing and this is what I always say that I hate the time travel being used in terms of storytelling because if you don't set the rules clear then you're just undoing your whole entire movie and you're asking the audience to go back and reevaluate the film rather than enjoy the whole storytelling experience and that's exactly what happened during this film overall. And then we come to the overall ending where we see Indy back in 1969 and we see Marion showing up once again and they get back together once more. Again, repeating the beats of the ending of Crystal Skull, but to a far less satisfying effect. Now, many people have compared this movie to Crystal Skull, and I certainly did say that for two thirds of the film, it was better than Crystal Skull. But no doubt about it, Crystal Skull had the far better ending, where we saw Indy and Marion getting married and walking off with him retaining his hat. I think that was the overall far more nicer and much more satisfactory end to see for the character. But for here, to just have the two of them recreating that kissing moment that we saw originally from Raiders, 
whilst very sweet, it didn't carry any satisfaction for the character because we all know that this will be the final time that we will be seeing Indiana Jones in this role. And I just think he deserved a far more satisfactory ending, something that was far more significant, far more memorable than just have him sitting in the room with Marion and then we see at the end he takes the fedora at the end of the movie. So just an overall very disappointing end for ultimately it was a very underwhelming and lacklustre fun entry within the Indiana Jones franchise. So that's it in terms of my spoiler review for Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Which movie stood out for you the best and stood out for you for the worst? Have there been any major elements that you think I've missed out on the movie? Let me know in the comments and then we can have further discussion. And if you have further topics or movies or television series that you'd like to see me discover, also let me know within the comments. And I will of course shortly be covering the opening numbers for the box office weekend of a release of Dial of Destiny. And I'm sure that's going to be very interesting for debate. It seems that that debate in terms of its performance has been going on for many months now. So I'm sure there'll be further inquests when we do indeed get those confirmation of opening numbers within the box office. So look out for all of that great content on the channel within the future. Now please also hit and like the subscription and notification buttons so I can provide you more high quality content like this in the future. But that's it for now. Take care of yourselves and I will see you very, very soon.